In this lesson, you will learn about inductive reasoning and conjectures. By the end of this video, you should be able to explain what is meant by inductive reasoning, use inductive reasoning to make conjectures, and find counterexamples to conjectures that someone else has stated. So let's start with inductive reasoning. What does it mean to use inductive reasoning? Well, essentially, all that it means is that you're looking for a pattern and you're making a hypothesis about what a next term could be or what the pattern might be. So for example, if I write out 1, 2, 3, you would use inductive reasoning to tell me that the next three terms would be 4, 5, 6. And you've been using inductive reasoning for a long time. So this is really just putting a new word on something that you're pretty comfortable with already. So for our first example, so for this first example, we're going to try to find the next term using inductive reasoning. So I might notice, well, it looks like to get from here to here, the first term to the second term, I'm doing multiplication by negative 2. And then again, I multiply by negative 2 to get to the third term. And it looks like that pattern continues all the way through, which confirms my original guess of multiplying by negative 2. Now sometimes I might have thought, oh, maybe I'm, you know, doing some other type of pattern, but you'll quickly find out one thing doesn't work, and you'll be able to um, guess and check the pattern that you've originally started with. So in this case, you might be asked to find the next three terms of this pattern. So in this case, I might say, okay, well, 48 times negative 2, that's just going to give me negative 96. And then when I multiply negative 96, by negative 2, I will get 192, and a final term 192 times negative 2 will give me negative 384. So my next three terms are negative 96, positive 192, and negative 384. And if I were asked to describe this pattern, I would just say that I would be multiplying the previous term by negative 2. and that would explain my pattern. So let's try another example. In this case, I'm going from 1 p.m. to 12.15 p.m. to 11.30 a.m. So I'm noticing that I'm going back in time, that I'm starting later, and then it's getting earlier and earlier, and it looks like there's a 45-minute change each time. So if I'm going to do 45 minutes earlier than 11.30 a.m. to continue this pattern, I'll get my next three terms of 10.45 a.m. and then 10 a.m. and finally 9.15 a.m. And again, I would just explain that I am doing 45 minutes earlier for each of these terms. For this example, it looks like it's not such a clear pattern. I'm not really sure where to start. I first think, okay, well, um, to get from 1 to 1, I multiply by 1, but that doesn't work. To get from 1 to 1, I add 0, but that doesn't work. Uh, let's see, it looks like I add 0, add 1, add 2, add 3, that doesn't work. So I really have to look at this very carefully, and I might look at multiplication or addition, but it's often a good idea to find differences between numbers. So it looks like the difference here is 0, and the difference here is 1, and the difference here is 1 again, and the difference here is 2, and the difference here is 3, and I'm noticing something a little bit interesting. It looks like these numbers at the top, 1, 1, 2, 3, seem to be repeated. It almost looks like I'm adding this term to this one down here, and I'm adding this one to this one down here. And in fact, it looks like that works out. If I do 1, If I start at the top here, 1 plus 1 will give me 2. And then 1 plus 2 will give me 3. And 3 plus 5 will give me 8. So if I wanted to continue this pattern, I would have to add 
look, 5 to 8, so that would give me 13. And then 8 to 13 to give me 21. And then 13 to 21 to give me 34. And this sequence is actually very famous. It's known as the Fibonacci sequence, and it's famous in what's called the Fibonacci spiral, as shown here, and as well as this golden ra uh, the golden ratio, which as we make this bigger and bigger, these sides approximate what's called the golden ratio. So now that we know how to use inductive reasoning to find patterns, we might try to make our own conjectures based on a statement. So in this example, we're asked to make a conjecture about the sum of two even numbers. So off the top of my head, I don't really know a whole lot about the sum of two even numbers, but I can make up some examples of adding two even numbers together and seeing what happens. So I might add, let's see, 2 plus 2 gives me 4. 2 plus 4 gives me 6. 100 plus 8 gives me 108. Um, 90 plus 4 gives me 94, and I'm looking for some kind of pattern. I'm looking to use inductive reasoning to come up with a conjecture here. And if I keep going, I might notice, hmm, I notice that there's something special about all of these sums. It looks like all of these sums are also even. So now that I have this idea, my conjecture, my idea is that the sum of two even numbers is even. And I might try to even come up with counterexamples to convince myself. I might try to come up with another 10 examples to show myself, no, I'm really convinced that two even numbers will also be even. And as you get into some higher level math classes, you'll have to prove this in general. But for now, as long as you've thoroughly convinced yourself and you've checked all of kind of the weird situations of negatives and zeros, you'll be okay. So for example, we might want to double check. Let's see, are we sure that it works with zero? Are we sure that zero plus an even number will give us an even number? Yep, I'm convinced. What about negative numbers? Am I sure that negative two plus negative six will still give me an even number? And it looks like I'm good there as well. Um, so I've convinced myself, and for our purposes for now, that will be enough. At this point, I'd like you to pause the video and see if you can try to make a conjecture about the next statement, the relationship between A and B if A plus B equals zero. So see what you can come up with, and when you're ready with your own conjecture, press play to again. Okay, sounds like you're back. So let's see what you came up with. I might look for some test numbers for A. So let's imagine, what if A equals 5? Well, if A equals 5, then 5 plus B would have to equal 0, which means B would have to be negative 5. And if A equals, say, negative 6, then negative 6 plus b would have to equal 0, so b would equal positive 6. I wonder if this holds in general. Let me try this special case of when a is 0. Then I'd have 0 plus b equals 0, which means that d would also have to equal 0. And it looks like in general, the numbers have to be opposites, one positive, one negative, but have the same absolute value or the same magnitude. And that seems to hold. Zero is kind of a funny case because zero is its own opposite, but it looks like it holds in general. So my conjecture might be if a plus b equals zero, then a equals negative b, or a and B are opposites. Now that we know how to make our own conjectures, we're going to see if other people's conjectures are okay. So we're going to test conjectures that other people have already made. In this first example, we're looking at a conjecture that says, if n is a negative number, then negative n is a positive number. 
So again, I'm going to start by looking at some examples. Let's say that n equals negative 5. Well, then the opposite of n, or negative n, would be positive 5. If n equals negative 100, the opposite of n, or negative n, equals positive 100. And since I'm confined to the fact that n is a negative number, this statement has to only be true, or needs only be true, when n is negative. So I think I can be pretty convinced that if n is a negative number, and I take a negative number and multiply it by negative 1 to get negative n, any negative number times negative 1 will give me a positive number. So I agree with this statement. I have sufficiently convinced. I've done enough, enough examples that I agree that it is true. I've convinced myself. Let's look at this next example. If the measure of angle ABC and the measure of angle BDE are equal, then the angles are vertical angles. Well, I either need to agree with this statement or I need to come up with what's called a counterexample to show that it is not true in every case. So I've talked a lot about vertical angles this year, and I do know that if ABC and ABD are vertical, let's say this one is A, B, C, and this one is D, B, E, then yeah, there's an example where I have two angles that are equal and they're also vertical. But I think I can come up with a counterexample to show that this is not always true. In fact, I think if I do A, B, C like this, and then put D on the same ray as C, and put E over here, and I say, well, what if these are both 90? Well, in that case, I've shown a counterexample to this conjecture, and I can say that this conjecture is false because of this counterexample that I have given. Below are three questions that we'd like you to try before you come to class tomorrow. Please write down the questions on your own piece of paper, give yourself plenty of room, and make sure that you show your work to explain how you answered the questions below.